Welcome, welcome back to the first day of the Systems Biology and Data Science Symposium in Miami. Um, so we want to get started because we need to stay reasonably on time. So the, the first speaker in the afternoon, afternoon session, um, we are super happy he could he could um, make it to the symposium is um, uh, Dr. Charles Nemorov. He is the uh, Miller, the Leonard Miller Professor and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Professor in uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and the Clinical Director of the Center of Aging. He is also a, a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science. So. Um, Derek put it together and he put together, he has 975 um, research papers. So um, I guess everybody can catch up on that. Um, so, Charlie, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for presenting. Um, welcome and um, yeah. Well, it's great to be here. Um, this will probably be the highlight of my day. So, um, you might think that I'm the token psychiatrist here to talk to you about how you feel today, but I'm not. I'm here to talk to you about data uh, because I understand what this symposium is like. This is normally a, a longer presentation. I'm only going to go through the first half of it, uh, which is really about the huge amount of data that we're collecting, biological and otherwise, in major psychiatric disorders and how difficult it has been for us to manage this data uh, to use it uh, for the clinical goals we have. So I have a multi-fold task uh, before me. I want you to try to know, know a little bit about depression, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, the big three major psychiatric syndromes that, that are accounting for the high rate of suicide in the United States and is such a major public health problem. And then I want you to know a little bit about the science um, uh, of these disorders and how we're managing it. Okay, does this work? I'm not sure, could you pass down the cursor on, on, the, on the keyboard? Oh, the keyboard, I can do that. Yeah. Great, here are my disclosures, they're on the website, you can read them in your leisure. Um, all the people who contribute to this uh, are my students who are now um, uh, all over the place, but just to give a, uh, a shout out to a couple of them. Um, Elizabeth Binder at the top is the only woman uh, director of a Max Planck Institute. She was my PhD student and uh, she's the director of the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Munich. Uh, done a lot of the genetics I've been talking to you about. Kerry Ressler is an endowed chair at Harvard. He was my resident and is a, um, uh, a Howard Hughes investigator, and he's contributed a great deal of this work. And then bunches of other people, some of whom are here with me um, in Miami. This is my recruiting slide that I use when I'm in the Northeast in February. Yeah. Keep this game. So fundamentally, like other complex disorders like diabetes and heart disease, depression and anxiety are fundamentally about how the brain responds to the environment. As you'll see, there is a very large genetic component to risk for psychiatric disorders. Uh, and that risk ranges from about 40% for major depression to 50% for schizophrenia to 65% for bipolar disorder. So of all of the major psychiatric disorders, these three in particular have a huge uh, genetic contribution. And therefore that begs the question of what do these genes, what are these genes, what do they do? What do they do cellularly? How do they result in changes that we see in our patients using functional brain imaging uh, methods? And ultimately, what, it, what is it have to do with, with their um, presentation clinically. So I'm going to use bipolar disorder as a quick example for you because it has such a large genetic component. Um, and this is what bipolar disorder looks like um, uh, in, in patients over time. Uh, most patients with bipolar disorder start with depressions as children. So they become depressed pre and these are discrete episodes of depression. 
um, that you can see here. And we also know that environmental factors have a major impact on the nature of their illness. So if they've been exposed to early life trauma, I'm going to talk to you a lot about this, child abuse and neglect, it worsens the course of the illness. And it does so actually by a gene environment interaction. And then at some point, the patients have their first manic episode, and then they end up in this terrible um, life cycle in which they alternate between mania, which often gets them into trouble and in the hospital, or severe depression associated with risk for suicide. So fundamentally, uh, what we're looking at here is really personalized medicine, which has two components. The component I'm going to talk to you about today is disease vulnerability. Who's at risk for a given disorder? Whether it's diabetes, heart disease, cystic fibrosis, asthma, obesity, or in our case, depression uh, or bipolar disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder. Can we identify who's at risk? And the large genetic contribution um, begs the issue of identifying biomarkers of risk. If we could identify those, then we could inter understand the disease better and then intercede early in terms of treatment. <clears throat> now, I put this slide in for all of you because you're into big data, and this is what we're grappling with in psychiatry. So I want to just take a minute. Each of these factors have been shown to contribute to disease vulnerability. That is, if you take a group of normal volunteers and a group of patients with any of these psychiatric disorders, there are reports of each of these being risk factors to the development of, um, of a psychiatric syndrome. So you can see it ranges from all of the obvious, genomics, epigenetics, metabolomics, transcriptomics. And as I'm saying this, I know you realize the size of these databases. And the challenge, and then we have all these environmental factors. How firm was, uh, secure was your environment as a child? What were your family dynamics like? Were you, you know, do you have a bad boss? What's your marriage like? What's your stress level? And all of these factors conspire to increase or decrease your diathesis, your risk for a given disorder. And this is the focus of much research in psychiatry now. So I'm going to say a few things about genetics. So when my, you know, uh, Francis Collins was my classmate in medical school, and uh, when he led the uh, uh, effort uh, uh, for the Human Genome Project, all of these um, remarkable uh, uh, articles, cover stories were published. And as you can see, um, you know, it was pretty much game over. We'll, we'll know everything we need to know about disease, about personality, <clears throat> et cetera. And you all know that this has not been realized. But as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> of all of the complex disorders, psychiatric disorders have the highest genetic contribution, <clears throat> more so than most forms of cancer, more so than cardiovascular disease. Um, and this has been good for our field because many geneticists have flocked um, to try to help us uncover these problems. And Jim Watson um, uh, paraphrased Shakespeare after the Human Genome Project was done and said, well, you know, we used to think our fate is in our stars. Now we know uh, in large measure our fate is in our genes. So this is an example of the ironclad evidence that bipolar disorder is genetically based. This is the concordance rate, meaning how likely is it for one twin to have bipolar disorder if the other twin has been diagnosed with that disorder. And comparing monozygotic and dizygotic twins, every single study has shown that monozygotic twins have very high rates of concordance, even if separated at birth. And this is just ironclad evidence that the risk for this disorder is, in fact, genetic. And for unipolar depression, major depression, common garden variety major depression, it's about 40%. So we did weakened studies uh, in bipolar disorder before the Human Genome Project was um, uh, uh, 
depleted, and we identified portions of the chromosome that had markers that seemed to confer risk for bipolar disorder. And then we did a number of studies looking at uh, uh, mechanisms of action of what caused these diseases, of which several neurotransmitter systems sort of stood out, including the serotonin system, the norepinephrine system, and the dopamine system. And, and there is very good evidence that these systems are involved in the biology of these disorders. The serotonin system, shown here, here's the serotonin transporter protein, sits on this membrane, and when serotonin is released from the nerve terminal, it's taken back up by this protein and recycled. And it's only expressed in serotonin neurons. <clears throat> we did imaging studies, and others confirmed it, that depressed patients have a reduction in the number of serotonin transporter sites in their midbrain, uh, which is probably a measure of a reduction in the number of serotonin neurons. And <clears throat> there's evidence that dopamine is involved in depression as well. And if you look at a measure of dopamine uh, 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 neuronal integrity, the dopamine transporter binding, and every age, depressed patients in the dotted line are lower than uh, normal controls. You also notice the loss of dopamine neurons as we age, which is why Roger Federer is so remarkable, right? I mean, Roger Federer is back here. He's lost half of his damn dopamine neurons, and he can still play tennis. You know, it's pretty remarkable. It's also why Tiger Woods is never going to be great again. But, uh, and then there's evidence that market effort is involved as well. I'm not going to bore you with these details. So the Human Genome Project was sequenced. And, you know, it's fascinating. But here's what it looks like, right? That's part of your genome. It's like, it reads like a novel, doesn't it? It's got four letters to the alphabet, except it has these SNPs. And it has, you know, five to eight million SNPs, depending on what species you're looking at. And some of these SNPs are functional, as you know. I don't have to go over that for this one. So I told you that serotonin was important for depression. And the serotonin transporter that regulates the amount of serotonin in the synapse has a polymorphism that's functional. And the polymorphism uh, can occur either as a long arm or a short arm. And you have one for each of your parents, obviously. But it turns out if you have the short arm, either as a homozygote or as a heterozygote, it's functional. You actually have a reduction in expression. So that finding led to a phenomenal paper published now uh, uh, more than a decade ago, which was ranked in, by Science Magazine as the second most important paper published that year. And it was a paper by um, a group at the Institute of Psychiatry in London in which they asked the question, is there a relationship between vulnerability to depression and suicide as a function of your genotype of the serotonin transporter in the absence or presence of early life trauma, child abuse and neglect? Because we know that early life trauma increases your risk for depression and suicide in adulthood. And this finding sort of set the stage for a whole new series of studies in psychiatry, namely that in the absence of child abuse, this was a cohort in New Zealand called the Dunedin cohort, it didn't matter what your genotype was of the serotonin transporter, you had a certain risk for depression. But look what happens in the face of child abuse and neglect. There's a very clear vulnerability genotype that markedly increases your risk of depression and turned out suicide. And a resilience snip. And even in the face of abject, miserable early childhood, you have absolutely no risk for depression whatsoever. So that led to a series of candidate gene approaches. And because stress is so important, in the biology of depression, because um, if you're genetically vulnerable to depression, you're exposed to stress, you will um, likely end up being catapulted into another episode. We 
started looking at the credit determined leasing format um, system, which is the brand's uh, orchestra of the stress response. Remember, it, it controls the pituitary adrenal axis as well as the autonomic immune uh, and behavioral responses to stress. And so we found elevations uh, uh, in this system in depressed patients. And then we decided to look at a genetic approach that I'm going to share with you. So we looked at 500 African Americans, largely, uh, waiting in uh, an inner city hospital in Atlanta to see an internist. Mean wait time about six hours. So these were not psychiatric patients. These were patients just waiting to see a doctor. And you can see that they are a highly indigent group. So you can see their household monthly income. A third of them had a monthly income of, of $250 or less. Um, and you can also see that two thirds were unemployed. And you can see their educational status here. Very few had attended college. So while they were waiting, we measured whether they were depressed using a standard instrument, the back depression inventory, higher than number more depression. We also measured their, their level of child abuse. And not surprisingly, the more child abuse they had experienced, the more depression they suffered. And you can see here the distinction by dichotomizing the group into none to mild child abuse and moderate to severe. And then we looked at polymorphisms of the uh, CRH R1 receptor um, and looked at whether there was a relationship between risk of depression using the back depression inventory severity scores in these three SNPs. We found virtually the same findings as Casting found with the serotonin transporter. We found that the absence of child abuse didn't matter what your genotype was of the CRHR1 receptor. But in the presence of it, there were three vulnerability SNPs and three resilience SNPs. And if you ended up with, for example, two of the vulnerability SNPs, then you surely uh, suffered with pretty severe depression. And if you had two of the resilient SNPs, even in the face of abject, miserable early life, you never became depressed. So we then turned our attention to post-traumatic stress disorder in the same population. Uh, this is, as you know, because of terrorism, combat, uh, domestic violence. This is the largest growing psychiatric diagnosis. And it's characterized by severe uh, 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 loss of social and occupational functioning, characterized by terrible fear flashbacks, nightmares, inability to sleep, high rates of suicide. And what you see here is that in this population, again, this non-patient population that we surveyed, you can see that post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms increase as a function of how much trauma you suffered as an adult. And then um, you can see that it also is a function of how much trauma you suffered as a child. And it turns out that Adult trauma and childhood trauma together are additive to your risk. So there is a gene, um, uh, there's a protein uh, uh, that's coded for by the MODP5 gene. This is a gene that codes for a glucocorticoid co chaperone protein, uh, which modulates the effects of cortisol, the ultimate mammalian stress hormone. And we were able to uncover along the various SNPs that you see here in this gene, we uncovered uh, four SNPs that met statistical criteria to interact with trauma in order to, particularly childhood trauma, in order to increase risk for post traumatic stress disorder. So here's a, a number of uh, uh, stressful life events, PTSD symptom severity. Here's a clear vulnerability SNPs and clear resilience SNPs. Now, what's really cool about this work is that um, we've been able to now show that in a second cohort that was just published that this genotype really does predict not only PTSD risk, but 
one is some type of depression with high rates of anxiety. Now, as you all know, in addition to SNPs, another way that gene expression is changed is by epigenetic mechanisms. And as you all know, um, the way this follows the works is by regulating methylation and acetylation, which allows the genes to be expressed or not expressed. And we were able to publish in Nature Neuroscience uh, this finding uh, that the, the, the mechanism by which the SNP for FKD compile increases risk for PTSD is actually through an epigenetic mechanism that only works on that particular genotype. And that's what you see here. These are childhood trauma uh, questionnaire scores. The higher the number, more childhood trauma. You see the change in methylation only occurs in this risk window. So I'm very excited about this, and I hope the video is going to work. But I was giving this talk in LA uh, to a lay audience trying to raise money. And uh, this producer came up and said, you know, you're a good scientist, but you can't communicate with the damn to the lay public. Thanks very much. She said, well, let me make this movie for you. Damn it, John. History was me. Do you get what I mean? I was so young. The fear from my past, I carry it with me. Can I ever become a much predicted risk for developing either depression or PTSD. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one, the PAP1 receptor, and this was published very proud of this by my students. You notice I'm not a co-author of this paper, it was published in Nature. Um, and, and this is interesting because we've struggled with why women are so much more vulnerable to develop post-traumatic uh, stress disorder than men. And, and this SNP only is a risk factor um, in women, uh, and, and as you can see here, uh, it really a very profound effect, and nature made us replicate this in two separate samples. There was no finding in men at all. This happens to be an estrogen responsive element. Um, uh, and then Klaus, uh, uh, then Klaus uh, uncovered another uh, SNP as well. 
I want to finish uh, and, and be critical of GWAS studies. So um, uh, I know that many people find GWAS studies popular, and I'm going I'm to take a alternate view and show you why I think we've invested. They were necessary, but I think they have not borne the fruit that we wanted. So as you know, um, the idea of GWAS studies is you collect a large number of patients and a large number of controls. It's no hypothesis. Um, and then you just see, um, you know, what genes, uh, uh, what gene SNPs stand out um, in the disease population compared to the controls. This is an example, a big study that was published, um, um, as you can see, in one of the Nature journals. Uh, and they studied 24,000 patients and controls, and they uncovered 56 genome-wide significant SNPs. There's the Manhattan plot. And you can see uh, these SNPs, which heretofore have not had any involvement at all um, uh, in the biology of bipolar disorder. But if you look at the data from where the countries, uh, 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 this is where the samples were collected, look at the odds ratios. They're really small. These are not big effects, right? 1.1. I mean, that's not an odds ratio you're going to write home about. Let me make the point even stronger. This is one of the papers I use for our journal club because I find it so annoying. This is the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, 150,000 subjects, and they reported in Nature that there were 108 GWAS significant loci for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So I took their strongest finding, and I want to show you the results. So what you're seeing here in yellow are the strongest findings in this study published in Nature. And I want you to see the frequency. And it's only like these are all 10 to the minus 9 to the 10 to the minus 12 p values, which would make you feel very impressed, right? Now look at the frequency of these genes in the control population and in the schizophrenic population, 30.1% versus 31.9%. Here's another one, 35.8% versus 37.7%. That's never going to be clinically useful. We are never going to be able to detect the difference between schizophrenic patients and controls or people who are at risk. Why is it so significant? Well, if you study 150,000 people, you have a lot of statistical power, but it doesn't give you any clue as to what's really going on, right? So I want to spend the last few minutes um, with a little more philosophy for you. Um, you know, when the Human Genome Project was published, the year before it came out, genomics, genetics textbooks said they thought that humans would have about 100,000 genes. You know why? Because we're the smartest and brightest of all species, right? It turned out we have 22,000 genes. In fact, look where we are in gene number, right? This is seaweed. <laughs> there are more genes in seaweed. And last week, a report came out that wheat has 100 million genes. Wheat, right? Well, that's a little worrisome. So the reason I'm harping on this is unlike other disorders, the psychiatric disorders do not naturally occur in lower animals. Okay, uh, animals do not commit suicide. They don't develop psychotic illness. These are uniquely human. So maybe there's something about humans that's unique. And maybe it has to do with complexity. And, you know, this is, of course, what we've all been taught, taught over the years, the Watson-Crick model. And as you know, um, investigators here and elsewhere have spent a great deal of time learning about non-coding RNA. And if you actually look at the proportion of non-coding RNA as a function of complexity, unlike gene number, it matches perfectly. And here we are right at the very top. And that has opened up a whole new field. You know what non-coding DNA was called at first? Junk DNA. Now, do you think God took 98.8% of the DNA and thought it would be junk? I don't think so. 
So it's obviously important, and it is important because now we view the genome as islands of conventional protein coding genes in a sea of regulatory information largely regulated by RNA, microRNAs, siRNAs, and, and that, I think, is where the future of research on pathophysiology is going to go. And we're beginning, um, in, in our department and others, to understand the importance of microRNAs. So um, what I wanted to give you a feel for is the huge amount of data that, that we have to collect to try to understand disease risk. I went with the data I showed you to the Department of Defense. I submitted a grant which I essentially said, we can, with a reasonable degree of likelihood, predict who among your recruitees would develop PTSD if they were exposed to battle. We've identified six to eight vulnerability genes. If they have these SNPs, so we could help you actually put these individuals um, in a desk job, but not in combat. And their response, to me privately was, we will never fund your research. You are trying to cut down on the number of people that we're recruiting into the service. Don't, don't bother to resubmit. <laughs> right? So uh, if I had more time, which I don't, I would talk about the other side of this, which is the prediction of treatment response. We have many good treatments for depression, bipolar disorder, and anxiety but we don't have any predictors of response. And the longer we wait to treat people, the more vulnerable they are to suicide, drug abuse, et cetera. So I'll stop here and be glad to take questions. Thank you. Yes. What is the advantage in terms of evolution of uh, bipolar depression? Yeah, you, know, you know, this is something that's been debated for a long time, uh, particularly the question of depression and bipolar disorder. So for bipolar disorder, the answer has been that a large, an inordinately large percentage of, of our most creative thinkers have been bipolar. So artists, novelists, poets, musicians, um, I could name, you know, 20 off the top of my head, uh, Van Gogh, is the one that most people think of, and why it's long. Uh, so a tremendous amount of creativity. Um, in terms of depression, um, uh, uh, many of the characteristics of depression are analogous to hibernation. So when patients become depressed, they don't leave the home. Um, so they're not vulnerable to any external threats. They tend to conserve energy. They stop eating. So they require less energy. But, but where this falls apart, this argument, is when you get to suicide. Because suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the United States. And it's the only one of the top ten that's increasing in number. And there's obviously no advantage to it. Right. So. What about transgender um, and origins of that relative to like, prenatal versus Postnatal trauma and, and suicide risk. So there's very little research in this area, but what we do know is that transgender individuals have an inordinately high rate of child abuse and neglect by history, um, and in particular sexual abuse. But the, I didn't talk to you about it today, but the prevalence of child abuse and neglect in the United States is extraordinarily high. So rate, the rates are somewhere like, depending on the six studies you look at, um, lumping all together sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse, and neglect, um, they come to something like 20% of the population of the United States has had at least one episode uh, in those four categories. Um, what's the metabolic state of mania? What do you, what's the learn about the kind of energy balance and like food, what um, activational versus lack of repression on pathways. What, is, what do we know? We don't know a lot because one, they're hard to catch. They don't like, you know, manic patients don't like to, um, they never seek help because they're masked. 
and they're energized and they're, you know, they get into trouble and then they get hospitalized and half of them are psychotic. But unlike depressed patients, they don't volunteer for research stuff. We know very little about them. Yes? Uh, is there any interest in genes related to glutamate functioning with all the hype about ketamine as metabolites being potentially useful? Yeah, I, I've written, you know, 10 uh, uh, articles on ketamine in the last year. I have an editorial coming out in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to, to answer your question other than to say that in my mind, the, uh, where the, 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 the richness here is likely in the signal transduction pathway down the ketamine with the mTOR pathway. And there are two or three startups that are looking at compounds or in, in preclinical models have antidepressant activity without the psychedelic hallucinogenic properties of ketamine. Because clinically, uh, ketamine, in my experience, it can improve mood briefly, uh, but it's very transient and, and we have no safety data on long term use. Micro LSD dosing. It really worrisome. So, are you from California? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of my medical school classmates is an orthopedist in San Francisco. And he, um, at our class reunion, he said to me, half my patients have taken 10 micrograms of LSD and they say it changed their life. You know, there's no data. <clears throat> there's never been a study. So, I'm uh, agnostic. Uh, I'm intuitively uncomfortable about it, right? Because, you know, it's LSD. Uh, but, um, you know, show me the data. This is really good to move about it. It changed her life. That's an end of one. You know, we always say is that um, uh, 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 anecdotes are not data. Thank you for my